This video was requested by a viewer, and if you're new here, I love taking suggestions about bands or artists or even genres that you think I should talk about. So please keep leaving those in the comments below. I've got a long running list, but I probably would have done a minor threat video even if it wasn't requested because I think this band is just so important to the history of punk music, just so pivotal, and they did things so differently than the rest of the bands in the scene. So let's just get into it. Let's dig into the story of Minor Threat. Punk music was birthed in the mid to late 70s, but pretty quickly bands started to get bored of the monotony of it, so they stripped it down to its roots and sped up the tempos and created something called hardcore punk. So kind of at the start of that change, a group got together and decided to make a jazz fusion type band, which they called Mind Power. When a friend introduced Mind Power to punk music, it completely changed their sound and the course of punk music forever. They changed their name to Bad Brains and then became one of the leading hardcore punk bands first in their Washington DC community and then across the East Coast and then arguably the entire country. I can and probably will end up doing a whole video on Bad Brains, so subscribe if you don't want to miss that story. Bad Brains grew to be so popular in the Washington DC underground scene that local college radio stations would play their music. In 1978, a local teenager who had grown up in Washington DC named Ian Mackay heard Bad Brains on a student-led AM radio station called WGTB, and Ian fell in love with hardcore punk. <laughs> Ian was born in Washington, D.C. on April 16, 1962. He came from a long line of writers. His grandmother wrote marriage advice columns, his grandfather wrote magazine articles, and his father was a pretty well-respected political journalist for the Washington Post. As a part of the White House press corps, Ian's dad was actually in the motorcade when JFK was assassinated. His parents raised him in kind of a pretty interesting environment. His childhood friend, Henry Garfield, said that his parents, quote, raised their kids in a tolerant, super intellectual, open-minded atmosphere, end quote. Henry Garfield would later move to California, change his name to Henry Rollins, and become the legendary frontman of the hardcore punk band Black Flag. I will also be doing an episode about Black Flag, so subscribe so you don't miss that one. Ian first met Henry around 1974. Henry was the new kid in school, and someone broke into his house and stole a bunch of his stuff. For some reason, Henry always thought that it was Ian and his friends who did that, so Henry had this vendetta and would try to beat them up anytime he saw them. But then one day, Ian and his friends were out skating, and Ian invited Henry to go skate with them, so Henry dropped his grudge, and they've been really good friends ever since. From an early age, Ian started to dabble with music, but nothing really stuck. He took piano lessons, but pretty quickly quit those. Then he tried to learn guitar around the age of 10, but he couldn't really understand the connection between the piano and the guitar, so he gave that up pretty quickly as well. Despite that, he said he would always knew he wanted to be a rock star since the age of 12 when he watched the Woodstock film. He said, quote, All I wanted to do was break guitars. We would just go shoplift plastic guitars and practice breaking them for our concerts. I didn't even learn how to play it, I just broke the thing. But despite that intense longing to be a rock star, he figured there was no hope for him because he didn't have much musical talent. Then he heard Bad Brains on the radio and first saw a band called The Cramps play at Georgetown University, which introduced him to punk music and he fell in love with the whole aesthetic of it. Ian said about seeing the Cramps play the first time, quote, by the time I saw the Cramps, I'd been listening to punk rock and I understood punk rock, but when I actually saw the Cramps, it was just wild. The place was way overpacked to the point where people were crawling in through the windows to get in. The Chumps and the Urban Verbs, two DC bands, played first, and they were very different from one another, so I was already seeing that punk could mean different things to different people. The crowd was such a mixture too, challenging every aspect of convention and life with fashion and sexual politics and regular politics." End quote. <laughs> In the summer of 1979, while still in high school, Ian took his first steps into that punk world. He met a guy named Jeff Nelson when Jeff decided to set off a pipe bomb outside of their school, and Ian was pretty interested in that, so he went to investigate, and then the two became friends. Jeff's father worked in the State Department, and as Jeff says, he lost all of 10th grade and about half of 11th grade to pot. 
So Ian and Jeff realized they liked a lot of the same music, so they formed a band, and I think they performed once as the Slinkies before it changed and morphed a little bit, and they became the Teen Idols. Jeff said about those early days playing hardcore punk in a scene that didn't really exist yet, quote, Bad Brains were a tiny bit older, and along with a couple other bands, they started playing new wave and punk stuff perhaps one or one and a half years before we did. I would say we were definitely influenced by some of the bands around town, but more so by early new wave slash punk records we bought or heard on the one good college radio station. We certainly looked up to the Bad Brains, and they were definitely responsible in large part for our band at that time speeding up all of our songs. End quote. Around this time, some of the corporate labels had gotten their hands on punk and were kind of changing things, basically creating new wave, which is something that the teen idols and the other underground bands really hated. They thought that punk had lost its edge and lost its sting. So they pushed back. They started shaving their heads or wearing mohawks, wearing more outlandish clothing with a lot of spikes and leather really anything to be confrontational in their music and their style. The teen idols practiced for a bit and played a few shows and then decided they were ready to record a demo tape. So in early 1990, they did two recording sessions at a local studio and were laughed at by the engineer in another band that was there. At the same time, the teen idols and kind of bad brains to an extent were trying to find their place in this punk community. They rejected the idea that punk bands had to be from New York. And at that time, the New York underground scene was developing its own reaction to New Wave that they called No Wave, and it was way more artsy than what the hardcore bands in DC and LA were doing. And that didn't really appeal to the teen idols at all. So they fell more in line with the rough, sped up punk that was coming out of California from bands like Black Flag and the Dead Kennedys. The band wanted a way to get these demo tapes out there and no label would touch them, so they took inspiration from some independent punk labels that were starting up, mostly out in California, and they formed a label that they called Discord Records. Discord Records released the Teen Idols debut album, which they called Minor Disturbance, in 1980. They cut, folded, and glued the packaging themselves because they couldn't afford to hire people to do it. They never intended for Discord Records to actually make any money. It was always a way for them to get there and their friends music into people's hands. They actually decided pretty early on that any money they made off of that Teen Idols album would go directly back into the label. And 40 years later, Discord Records is still going strong and still releasing really interesting music from local DC bands. And those local DC bands are getting a pretty great deal on their contracts. By the end of 1980, the Teen Idols had decided to break up. One member, Georgie Grindle, got a new girlfriend who happened to be a Christian and didn't like the band, so Georgie started to not like the band. It didn't help that Jeff Nelson was an outspoken atheist, so him and Georgie got into some pretty heated arguments. They played their last show on November 6th at the 930 Club, opening for a former member of Jefferson Airplane. At that time, there were some pretty complicated laws in terms of underage drinking and bars. It was something like you weren't allowed to sell alcohol without also offering food, but if you offered food, you then became a restaurant, and you weren't allowed to ban people from a restaurant based on their age. But these punk clubs and venues started to realize that the fine for not allowing underage people into a restaurant was much less than the fine for providing alcohol to underage people. So they just wouldn't allow any minors into the venue so they could just not have to worry about that underage drinking thing. Ian didn't really like that. So he and the teen idols came up with this idea that they could just draw black X's on the back of their hands to let the venue and the bar staff know that they were underage and still get into the show. That X on the back of the hand became a staple for a kind of philosophical movement that Ian spearheaded, but we'll get to that in a bit. Once the Teen Idols broke up, Ian and Jeff decided to stick together and form a new band with Ian on vocals and Jeff on drums. Obviously, they knew they needed more musicians than that, so they recruited Lyle Pressler, who was a private school kid from a band called The Extorts. And once Lyle left The Extorts, he was replaced by Henry Rollins, who was still going by Henry Garfield. And then they changed their name to State of Alert and continued on, but that's a topic for a different day. Lyle had been singing in The Extorts, but he wanted to switch to guitar, which worked out perfectly for what Ian and Jeff were looking for. Lyle then introduced them to a guy named Brian Baker. Brian was a bit of a guitar prodigy as a kid. He actually grew up in Detroit and he got to jam with Santana at one point, but he had just started playing bass and they brought him in 
to this new band to play bass. Both Lyle and Brian were a bit afraid of Jeff at first, since he had a pretty aggressive looking mohawk and often wore an old German officer's uniform that he found, but Jeff said that that look was mostly just him being shy. So the lineup was complete and they played their first show in December of 1980. For that show, there were about 50 people stuffed into a basement. They wrote a song called Minor Threat that was about the struggles of trying to find your way in the world as a young person, and they liked that, so they decided to call the band Minor Threat. Pretty quickly, they developed their signature style style of playing their instruments as fast as they possibly could to create a kind of jackhammer of sound. A friend of theirs named Guy Picciotto, who would sometimes sit in on their rehearsals, said, quote, just being in the room and watching them practice, the force of Ian's delivery and the way those guys worked, it was really pretty intense, end quote. The Teen Idols had already built up a pretty decent following for a scene that was so tiny, so that carried over to Minor Threat, and they already started with a little bit of an audience. After playing a few more local shows, they became one of the leading bands of the DC hardcore punk scene, basically second only to Bad Brains. While doing this, they pioneered a new culture and a new philosophy and a new aesthetic within the punk scene that they called Straight Edge. The roots of Straight Edge really go all the way back to 1974 when a teenaged Ian spent several months living with his parents out in California. While he was away, a lot of his friends got really into drinking and smoking weed, so when he got home, he saw the outcome of that transition and he didn't like it all that much. He said, quote, These kids are 12, 13 years old and this is it. This is what they are going to do for the rest of their lives because that's what it felt like, this eternal quest to get messed up. That's entertainment. I was not interested, end quote. Ian became really annoyed with the centrality of drinking and drugs in the punk scene, especially after seeing the horribly detrimental effects that it had in people's lives with, like, the Sid Vicious situation that was happening. So he made the conscious decision to stay sober, and he wrote the song Straight Edge about that decision. A lot of kids really resonated with the message of that song, and they adopted Straight Edge as a label for this new sober lifestyle. But beyond just not drinking and not doing drugs, it promoted a lot of positivity, which was at odds with the nihilism and anarchy that typically existed within the punk space. Ian said he came up with the name because he thought, quote, okay, fine, you take drugs, you drink, whatever, but obviously I have the edge on you because I'm sober. End quote. Being straight edge became somewhat mandatory for the community that they were forming around Discord Records. I mean, they didn't make you sign a contract or anything, but it was widely understood that if you wanted to be a part of this, you kind of had to fall in line a little bit. And I think a lot of that just has to do with how large Ian's personality was. He was really good at building a following and motivating people. He could have been a really good cult leader if he wanted to be. But Ian says he never wanted to start a movement. He simply wanted to defend himself from people thinking he was the weird one for not wanting to drink. As Minor Threat built up their song repertoire and started to play around more, Ian says that the band was really fueled by anger. He said, quote, I was very angry. I was 19 and about to leave the ranks of the teenagers, and I was furious. The evolution of punk rock had grown from these silly kids to being embattled silly kids to being embittered silly kids, then embittered kids, and then violent embittered kids. It just kept getting ratcheted up a notch, end quote. Through this time, they had built a pretty shocking image, but then started to get a little bit annoyed at people getting shocked by their image. They were being constantly harassed by people who thought that they were dangerous or strange, and the older punk bands didn't take them seriously at all. All of that started the process of disillusioning Ian to the whole punk scene, but Minor Threat pressed on. Their first record was Discord's third release, and it was an untitled EP that they released in May of 1981. It was eight songs in 11 minutes that were all very targeted towards certain things in their community and in their lives that made them angry. They avoided the larger issues of what was going on in the political landscape because they felt like they didn't know enough to talk about it. So they focused on what they did know, their scene and their community and what was happening there. Discord had a lot of loose connections with different indie labels and and indie record stores, so they used those connections to piece together a long tour across the country in 1981. But things happened and they didn't make it the whole way, but still the intent was there. 
Then they released a four-song EP called In My Eyes later in 1981. That album started a little bit of a backlash because of the really heavy straight edge themes on that album people started seeing minor threat as puritanical and dictatorial in the way that they told people what they should be doing which is very much not punk this also led to some tension within the group jeff wanted ian to make it clear in the lyrics that ian was saying i don't smoke i don't drink but i'm not telling you what to do Ian refused that, and it led to a pretty big argument. Ian finally relented when he realized the rest of the band was feeling kind of pinned in by his style and his ideas. And then Ian saw other bands take up the straight edge mantle and become very militant and aggressive about it, and that didn't sit well with Ian at all. Ian and Jeff moved into a house together to really focus in on Discord Records. They even named it Discord House, and they started to build a really tight community there which is what the two of them always wanted out of punk. And then while everything was churning along, Lyle decided he wanted to go to college. So in December of 1981, Minor Threat played one last farewell gig before Lyle went off to Northwestern. After that farewell gig, Brian Baker joined a group called Government Issue, and Jeff and Ian worked on their own side project, but the hiatus wasn't going to last all that long. Lyle quit school after one semester, and Brian was not happy in government issue. So when HR from the Bad Brains urged Ian to get the band back together, they did. They picked up right where they left off and played their first show back in April of 1982. It was a little bit of a rocky start, though, because in the scene in those days, once you broke up, it was kind of seen as taboo to get back together. So they had a little bit of that initial tension to push past, but they did. Later in 1982, Brian said that he wanted to switch to guitar or he was going to quit the band. In an effort to make that transition easier, he even went out and found a replacement bassist, a guy named Steve Hansgen, who actually played the bass parts better than Brian did. So now with two guitarists, they recorded the album Out of Step in January of 1983. It was the band's only full-length album, and a lot of the songs on it actually took aim at the hardcore community that they were a part of. That community was in the early stages of decline, even if Ian was the only person who noticed that. Bruce Pavitt wrote in the Seattle Rocket that Out of Step was, quote, honest, introspective, this release focuses on pride, honor, and friendship, end quote. Despite releasing this debut album that people seemed to really like and it really resonated with people, the band was starting to unravel. Jeff said that he and Ian were just too close. Between being in the band together, living together, working on Discord together, there really wasn't any space at all. Since Ian wrote these songs for his small, tight-knit community, when they attracted an audience beyond that, these new people really didn't understand the context or where Ian was coming from, and a lot of the message was lost on them. But in the spring of 1983, with hardcore flourishing across the country, Minor Threat embarked on a long U.S. and Canada tour. It was still to smaller crowds, but there was at least plenty of places to play, and that wasn't the case the first time they tried to tour. A major facet of a Minor Threat show was always crowd interaction. Ian would be with the crowd, they would come up on stage, he would hand the microphone off to anyone who wanted to sing, but once their music broke out of just that tight community, those interactions could often turn violent. Ian said, quote, when Minor Threat was on tour, I would get into fights every night. End quote. They also started to get taunted by the other bands, especially about their straight edge stance, and Jeff and Ian got into quite a few little arguments about it. Jeff said, quote, it was like being on tour with one of your parents. End quote. By 1983, violence had become kind of a key part of the hardcore punk community, especially at shows. Ian said that the scene started to get taken over by people who were attracted to what the media said punk was all about, which was violence and aggression and fighting. They didn't care about the music or the philosophy or the community. They only wanted to go to the show to bash heads. So when the older punks stopped going, quote, then it's the idiot's domain. End quote. By the summer of 1983, most of the core of the DC hardcore punk community had dropped out of the scene. Ian's Brothers Band, which was a beloved band called Faith, broke up and it left a lot of people in the scene feeling like, what now? Ian said, quote, We realized it was done. The cake was made. You can't cook it anymore. End quote. Also by this time, the new bassist, Steve, started to kind of really hate their fans and the whole fan interaction part of their shows and Brian wanted to switch back to bass, so Steve left. Also around this time, Lyle and Jeff started to get really into U2 and more slow and melodic styles of music, 
which honestly Ian just did not have the vocal chops to pull off and he wasn't really all that interested in trying to. It got to the point where Ian wouldn't even go to practices. He would just let the band work on songs that everyone knew he wouldn't be able to sing. Ian never considered himself all that close to Lyle or Brian, but now even his super close relationship with Jeff was starting to struggle. Ian said, quote, I really wanted to continue to move more subversively, and he wanted to go more mainstream. I couldn't understand it. End quote. Ian also grew more and more concerned and uneasy about their success and newfound fame within this community. He was disgusted when he saw that a ticket to their show was going for $13. So he voluntarily slashed the band's pay in order to get the ticket prices down, which the rest of the guys in the band were not all that happy with. By the end, almost every practice was devolving into arguments, and it all just became too much. It ended with a note from Jeff on Ian's door that said, quote, the band has decided to break up, so just split the money up, end quote. Ian didn't want to let it go that easily, so he called a group meeting where the band presented him with some demands. And it was at that meeting, after hearing those demands, that Ian realized that he and the other guys were just in two completely separate spaces, so they decided to break up. After the split, Steve formed a band called Second Wind with a minor threat roadie named Rich Moore. He also played with Government Issue in 1986. In the 90s, he played with a band called M Appeal and worked as a sound engineer for bands like Tool. In 2003, he reunited with Brian Baker to work on a project that they called Middle Aged Brigade, and he joined another band called Rust Bucket. Brian Baker formed Dag Nasty in 1984, then he joined Samhain, which was Glenn Danzig's new project after he left Misfits. I have a whole episode on Misfits, so check that out if you want to learn more about Glenn Danzig and what was going on with that. Brian played with a few other punk bands before joining Bad Religion in 1994, replacing Brett Gurowitz. Since then, he's played on several bands' albums, and he stayed pretty active in the music scene. Lyle Pressler also played in the first iteration of Sam Hine, and he played with another band called The Meat Men, but he retired from performing and ran Caroline Records, which was the label that signed Ben Folds, among many other artists. He then went on to work for Elektra and Sire Records before becoming a lawyer. Jeff Nelson continues to run Discord Records with Ian. He also worked on a few different side projects with Ian and opened his own label called Adult Swim in 1989 that is kind of affiliated with Discord. He moved to Toledo, Ohio in 2003, and he played drums for a band called Fast Piece of Furniture that released an album in 2007. Ian continued to define underground music when he started Fugazi in 1987, which has been called one of the most important and influential post-hardcore groups. I'm sure Fugazi deserves its own video, so maybe that'll come down the line. Let me know in the comments if that's something you're interested in. Fugazi has refused to play shows with high-priced tickets, and they once turned down an offer to play Lollapalooza because the tickets were overpriced. They were $30. Fugazi went on indefinite hiatus in 2002. Ian says that the band is not broken up, they're still friends, and in fact they all still jam together sometimes when they're all in DC, they just have been too busy to give Fugazi the time that it deserves. They've been offered large amounts of money to reunite Fugazi, but as you can probably tell, it's never about the money for Ian. Ian formed another group called The Evens with Amy Farina. They released a couple of albums, then Ian and Amy formed a group called Koriki, with the basis from Fugazi in 2015, they released their first album in 2020. So that's the story of Minor Threat, a band that always did things exactly the way they wanted to and ended up changing music. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Let me know what I got wrong or what I should have covered and didn't. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you want more of these stories from music history.